follow, follow very much on from, uh, from Meryl's talk. Where's, where's my Microsoft colleague gone? He, was, he, he, he gave... Meryl, where have you gone, mate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there you are. So I'm going to follow very nicely on. Thank you very much, Meryl, because that's going to be a great, great, great follow-on for me. So, uh, um, everybody, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you for the uh, Identity Security Alliance also for allowing us to have this day. So my talk's going to be the about mic's the... mic's here for, for audio. Pardon? There's another mic there for audio for the, for the video. For the recording. Oh, see, no, I didn't know that. Tell me that piece before. Right. So the identity security blind spot of legacy systems and service accounts and applications. So following on a little bit from what Meryl was talking about. And conveniently, I have my first slide, which talks about the Microsoft Digital Re Defense Report that was done in November. And, and the reason I want to talk about this is this kind of, kind of set the scene a little bit as to what are these problems that we're seeing? Right? We, we understand that there are very complex environments out there. We have, these, we have these environments with legacy systems, legacy assets, legacy applications, all of this on-premise stuff um, that still pose a risk to organizations. We also know, and we're all here today, and we, we, we've, we've seen it from the introductions earlier, that password-based attacks, compromised identities, are, are a significant source of the threats and the vectors that attackers are using compromised systems. But we also know through, you know, if we look at the reports, there are some very key fundamental controls that are effective in terms of improving the security hygiene of organizations, improving their cyber resilience. And one of those, which we've touched on many times today, is multi-factor authentication. It could be down to SMSs and one-time passwords, it could be all the way over to Ubico FIDO2 tokens. Right? And you know, we look at these things and we look at the fact that these are effective controls, they can help us defend against ransomware, they can help us defend against lateral movement. So, why is it that we aren't using these things in environments? The challenge is, is because that legacy systems are around and they still represent a risk to organizations. Right? And we look at these stats from this Microsoft report, and you see that there's, a, uh, call it three kind of categories, right? Typically it's to do with hygiene. Right, configuration, security hardening, guidelines and practices of your identity environments. Right. Then there's a range of things around legacy protocols, legacy authentication, privilege access controls, workstations, etc. And then there's a whole load of things around multi-factor authentication. And I, and I like to roll this one up to poor adoption, low adoption of multi-factor multi authentication everywhere for everything, including legacy systems and applications and environments that attackers use to exploit to get access to the environment. Right, so let's look about some other reports. We've got the Verizon Data Breaches Report. Right? One of the four key things is compromised credentials to get into environments. Let's go and take a look at a report from our friends over here at CrowdStrike. Right? Prolific abuse of valid credentials to enable access and persistence. Let's look at a very local customer here, and thank you to them for actually publishing this. It's very insightful information. Right? There's a lot of customers that struggle with this, but let's look at this. They accessed our system using a username and password. We didn't push the extra controls over them, and once they're in, to use the two-step authentication versus two-factor authentication, once they're in, well, there was just usernames and passwords to get around the environment and gain access to systems. Fantastic, that's great. Once you're in, you can get anywhere you want. Brilliant. And, and, and let's look at another report from Red Canary, probably uh, about two weeks old, and we talk about some of the techniques attackers use. And not, now we're not just talking about these, these credentials that they're using, but actually they're talking about the tools that they're using. Legacy tools, PowerShell, command line interfaces, WMI, things that you pretty much can't apply multi-factor authentication to. So we know how to phase an effective control. Everybody knows how to use it. Even my wife knows how to use it, and she's not the most technically illiterate person. Right? But she knows how to use it. Everybody's got these modern identity platforms, these SaaS applications, maybe they're perimeters that are using 
these modern identity security controls, right? There's our ID, it's got MFA all over it, Okta, Ping. Fantastic, fantastic technologies, fantastic tools. Very effective controls. The problem is, there's a whole load of systems that they don't cover. Again, legacy applications, on-prem applications. We talked about the ACSE, Essential 8. We talked about the maturity levels. One, two, three. How do you bring those controls to those legacy environments? What about admin interfaces? We just saw in that earlier slide about Red Canary. Attackers are using things like PowerShell, WMI, PSXX, command line tools that do not have native MFA capabilities. So how do you apply these controls to something like that? Legacy protocols used by ransomware, you know, file shares that people connect to, you double click on the G drive, you get access to it. Ransomware does the same thing, connects to them, scans them, encrypts the files, holds you to ransom. So we've got all of these environments that are stuck with these legacy authentication. We can't bring those modern security controls to them. And so attackers know this. Attackers know that you've got MFA on the front door. That's great, fantastic. Your modern SaaS web app, your RDP, your VPN, great. Problem is, they're going around that. They're getting around it. They're using the command line tools. They're using PowerShell. They're using service accounts. You can't even MFA a service account. How do you put some controls around it? Legacy applications, file shares, so all of these things are commonly used in these data breaches and these compromises, lateral movement, ransomware, etc. So what do we do? So I'm going to now give you the vendor pitch, but it's not the vendor pitch. So what about if we had a different approach? What if we had an approach where we could say, let's take those modern controls you have and integrate them into the legacy backend identity infrastructure, right? That would allow you to bring together those modern controls through your legacy Active Directory environments to those other legacy on-prem applications and systems. Right? This is not about putting it on every single application and system. This is about putting it in the identity infrastructure and using that to control and provide that extension, multi-factor authentication. Right? And, and the beauty there is that you then take those controls, again, we've talked about MFA, but let's look at conditional access. If this, then that, well, you can also integrate that capability into your legacy Active Directory environment, to your legacy infrastructure. Right. Giving you some great visibility, some great reporting, and the ability to, to enforce those controls. So, before I go on to the last two slides I have left, I have a 20 second demo to show you how we're gonna do this with a legacy application, PowerShell, that an attacker would use to compromise an environment and move around. I'm going to tell you how we do this, and then I'm finished, and then we're going to be close to beer, right? So I've got plenty of time left for questions, so we're all good for that. So does anybody have any questions that they want to ask now before I move on to the demo? No? Okay. Fantastic. So I'm just going to tell you quickly what we have on the screen here. Over on the far side, you'll see a Microsoft Authenticator in a iPhone. And over here on the left hand side, you'll see a remote desktop with PowerShell. We're going to execute a command. We're going to connect to a remote application server. And we're going to run a couple of commands on it. Typical kind of thing that an attacker would use. Typical kind of thing an admin would use, quite frankly. It's a perfectly legitimate command to be used as an administrator to go perform some activity. Problem is attackers can use this too. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that we're going to apply multi-factor authentication to this. We're going to deny, block them from being able to perform this. So I'm going to execute the command. So on the right hand side you see a pop-up. I'm going to click deny. And you're going to see over here the connection is denied. You get the PowerShell red error message. Right? Username and password is incorrect. Attacker doesn't know there's any multi-factor authentication in the way. As far as they're concerned, maybe the credentials that I compromised as compromised identities, hmm, maybe I got the wrong ones. Maybe the hashes I dumped when I compromised this machine before I wanted to try and move around laterally, maybe the hashes I dumped to try to you know, crack or pass the hash or something like that. Maybe there was something wrong with them. Maybe they were old. They don't know. 
And so we've just applied multi-factor authentication to a legacy command line interface that uses Kerberos or NTLM to authenticate to a domain controller that doesn't have these capabilities. And yet we've brought ZORAD multi-factor authentication on the authenticator, which I think was level two, correct me if I'm wrong down to a legacy application, a legacy system, on-premise, and environment. So, how do we do it? This slide's not supposed to look like this. So, I'm gonna press the next button and hope that this is gonna work out okay. <clears throat> a little bit messy, but let's get through it. So, at the top left, you've got your users or your service account, and they typically wanna access the system over there on the right run PowerShell, you want to connect to a remote system. When you do that, your request to access that system gets authenticated via a central identity infrastructure. Right? And if we start looking at legacy world, in this case, let's look at Active Directory domain controllers. Well, the first authentication takes place. The authentication takes place. But before we send the response back, what we do is we can send off a, a request or a query for a second opinion. Let's go and query this, this protection platform for this second opinion. Right? This user has tried to access that application. This service account has executed there, used NTLM to authenticate, to access something. Before I send that authentication back, I actually go over for a second opinion. Now we have a policy engine. Let's put in some policy here. Am I allowed to do that? We've got risk-based engine in here, right? So you can start looking at what are the risks of this user. You're seeing all of this authentication activity constantly, the whole time. Let's bring in some threat intelligence telemetry. Let's bring in some threat intel from SailPoint. Let's bring in some of the Microsoft identity threat intelligence. Let's bring in all these indicators that you can feed into this to make a decision. Do I allow this? Do I deny this? Or actually, do I want to verify that this user is who they are. And if I'm gonna verify them, let's reach out and leverage the existing multi-factor authentication controls you have. If you've already got Okta, let's use Okta. Maybe you've got a hybrid. Maybe you've got some Okta, you've got some Microsoft as already, and you've got some Yubico keys. You've got a mix of these different authenticators, these different strengths of authentications, based on maybe different maturity levels, the criticality of the assets, so on and so forth. But let's go out, let's verify you. You verify successfully, we go back to the platform. Platform says, fantastic, thank you. Goes back to the identity infrastructure. Yes, you are allowed to connect. Or, no, you're not. And that's it. I'm done. I have, uh, hopefully it comes back. So if there are questions, please feel free to ask. We have seven minutes for questions, folks. Otherwise? Service accounts. Okay, service accounts, very, very good point, right? So service accounts, you cannot apply multi-factor authentication to. So this is not just about multi-factor authentication, this is about those modern identity security controls. Think conditional access. Conditional access is if this account coming from here, going over there, a certain risk level, et cetera, et cetera, is allowed or denied. The problem in a legacy Active Directory world you can't apply that kind of policy. So service accounts are typically being created a long time ago. They were typically created with a probably fairly simple password. They've probably got high privileged access, especially if they were created 10 odd years ago. Somebody just said, let's just give them domain admins and we'll work it out later, right? So you've got these high privileged accounts that are long-lived accounts with passwords they haven't changed in a long time. You can't MFA them. And, and, and they can be used to get around your environment lateral movement. So what we can do is we can say, well, hold on. Because we're seeing all of the authentication happening in the central identity infrastructure, we can build up a picture. We talk, there was an earlier topic and talk about machine learning. I'm not going to go down the other two-letter acronym. I'm going to just go with machine learning at this stage. But we can use that to build up a behavioral profile and a baseline of what is a service account doing? Where is it coming from? Where is it going to? What protocol was it using? How regular is it? Build up a picture and then use that to apply a policy and say that service account I know is always used from there to there. 
using a particular protocol, maybe even at particular times of day. If it falls outside of that, block it. You've got a policy engine. Point three. You don't have to MFA it. We could just have a conditional access policy to the to that conversation. So hopefully that hopefully that answers that question. Any other questions from anybody in the audience? Fantastic. Ah, Sue. Sue has the smallest writing in the world, just in case anybody needs to see that today. Fantastic question, excellent. I'm glad that you asked that in the last five minutes. So I have a very good colleague here from Microsoft, which is, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna point out to him also, right? So what we've done is we've worked with the vendors of the identity infrastructure to work out how is the best way to integrate with them, right? And if you look at, obviously, things like Azure AD and Okta and Ping, those ones are all modern ones. They have APIs, we can work with them, we can integrate with them, we have plugins, that sort of stuff. The challenge obviously comes to something like Active Directory Domain Controllers. These are legacy platforms that aren't, you know, don't have those accessible APIs and so on and so forth. So what we've done is we've worked in conjunction with some of the Microsoft identity team, some of the developers over in Israel and so on and so forth, to have a plugin that runs on the domain controller. And the plugin that runs on the domain controller is purely there to do two main things. Firstly, we need a way to pause the authentication before we send a response back, right? So we've got to hold that. That's the first primary purpose of it. The other primary purpose is to take a copy of the metadata. What's the machine that it's coming from? What's the protocol being used? What's the user name, right? It's being used to access the thing, the target system, right? No credentials, no hashes, no passwords, no funny memory injections, no LSAS injections, no DLL rewriting, nothing. What we're doing is we're taking that metadata and we're sending off that request to the platform. And the platform is then where we make that decision. We then maybe reach out to MFA. We go back to that adapter, that, that, that plug-in on the domain controller that's holding the authentication response. The authentication's already done. Right? All we're doing is doing a second opinion, a verification. So that holds that response, assuming that the platform has come back and said, yes, you have verified successfully or you've passed the policy, we just say to that little adapter, you know that little authentication you're holding that was already successful? You can now let it go onto the network. And therefore, the user successfully accessed it. 20 seconds. <laughs> According to my watch, I have three minutes. You should have told me that earlier. So there's no changes to the user's machine, there's no agents on the user's machine, there's no changes to the target application, there's no change to the protocol, there's no password decryption, no hashes being swapped around, nothing. That's it, entirely transparent. Apparently my time's up. Time's up. So, I would love to answer your question, but I'm gonna have to go over to the booth where there's a bunch of empty cups and uh, we can chat. Get those sorted out. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you. much, Bill. Thank you, my friend. Now, last, second last speaker for today, Dragan Vladikic from Okta. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian.